Name another podcast like this. Who gon' bring it to the table? Boss talk. Who your girlfriend favorite? Boss talk. We gon' do it how you want it. Boss talk. Yeah, everybody on it. Boss talk. It's a unique hustle. Check it, check it, check it. This is a unique host. It's your boy ECO, and I'm here with the lovely, amazing, official Miss Jamaica. What's going on? Nothing, nothing. You know, my dad walk on. Man, hey, man, check it, man. Hey, we in the building, man. It's going down. Uh, man, hold up, man. We got a special guest in there today, y'all. Uh, this guy right here, he don't really need an introduction, man. He's uh, one of those guys, man, that, you know, he been through a lot. And sometimes we bring people on the show that been through a lot and uh, know a lot about a lot of things, but we might not have ever got to hear these stories uh, uh, just with one just click of a uh, 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 of a extra part of a mistake he might not even been here so man this guy right here man Kevin Mumford is in the building yes, hey sir. man live and direct and it's going down man so uh, yeah gotta answer this one I know so 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 you know this is how we like to take it so I want to know about you growing up. You're born and raised here in Texas. No, in Oklahoma City. Oklahoma, Dallas. Oklahoma City. What part? Hold Oklahoma on. City, the east side of Oklahoma City. Okay, and what was it like growing up in Oklahoma City? Because when I think about, well, Oklahoma, I think about it being country, race. This is what I'm hearing because I'm not from here. I'm from Jamaica, so I hear about how racist Oklahoma is. Yes. See, that's what a lot of people think Oklahoma is racist cowboys. But to be honest, I, well, my story is going to be like really validating it because I grew up next to a farm. Mm. <laughs> and I tell people I was a cowboy before I was a crip. Really? <laughs> Wearing like cowboy, cowboy hat boots and all nah, of that? No, nah, nah. <laughs> I just liked horses. Just like horses? Yeah. yeah. Wow. Okay. So, so you were raised with your mom and dad, brother, just mother, sister, just your mother. Where was that? In Garden Days. And um, that's where my book for Garden Block is called Garden Days and Garden Notes. It's a community on the east side of Oklahoma City. Okay. And where was your dad during this time? Uh, I don't know. Somewhere. Have you ever met him before? Yeah, I met him and knew him, but I ain't never. Growing up, as I got older, we came closer. Came but closer. I could go see him on my own. Yeah. So you say you could. So was it that thing? Cause you know we grown now, mm -hmm. so we know that sometimes in relationships, you know, mom and dad can't get along. Mom mm -hmm. keep the kids from dad. Was mm -hmm. that the situation, nah. or it was just he just didn't want to come around? Nah, I really don't know what their situation was, but. He came, he was more like a disciplinary. I guess whenever I got in trouble, my mother see him, so I really didn't want to see him. Oh, okay. When I see him, I must have done something wrong. Oh, okay. But no, I don't know. Now as I got older, I, young people be thinking like, to mother and father not knowing, they be like, well, daddy ain't no good. Mm -hmm. I never thought that. And like I said in one of my little views that uh, I never felt the absence. That's what I was wondering. If he wasn't there, you, don't, you didn't. So what knew. filled that void if you never felt that absence? I don't, nothing really, because. Just didn't think about nobody, it. And my mother, my sister, and brother's father wasn't there either. So I never even, in my home, I knew dudes down the street, one dude, one other dude might have a father and a mother in their home, but other people, it wasn't common. So I say, I never even missed it. Like some kids now that, well, my father was missing. They'd be mad and holding grudges or something like that. I never, honestly, never thought about it. Mm. My mama held us down. She worked at Jim Motors and Montgomery Wards. So and, she had a good job. And yeah, so and I, I had the hospital, so we ain't never... So she had two we, jobs. She had two jobs. Then when she worked working for Jim Motors, she just started working there, and that's where she retired from. So were you the type of person, because, and I'm relating a lot of things to the people that sit in that seat and the stories that I hear, mm -hmm. and um, it seemed like it's usually the same story, whereas... When mom worked two, three jobs, that's the reason why you succumb to the streets because you were always out on the streets because she was never there. Was that the same for you? I don't think so. My dream's always been, like I stated in my book, that uh, I just like wanted to be a part of like organized crime. You know, I looked. You up just to, wanted to do that. I, I looked up to Lucky Luciano and um, Al Capone, and I went Sicilian, so I joined what I could join the African gang. So what exactly about it that glamorized you into wanting to be that oh, part? I guess fortune, fame, and women, and they ain't want drugs, but, you mm -hmm. know, it was, that was just the power. And you basically. saw it 
on the streets or you saw it on TV? Where did you see that that made you want to do that? Because I'm just wondering, was it your environment or was it, because I'm trying to figure out, because you know, being a parent now, you want to know what is affecting your children. You know, nowadays it's the phone, we know that, but Mm, back then, what was it? Was it the TV or was it something that you were seeing around you? Maybe seeing some mafia movies back then, but I don't know, it gets just embedded in me because as you know, the streets also have that level of crime. Mm-hmm. You know, you see people in the big Cadillacs, Fleetwood pimps, and all that stuff back in my day growing up. And I'm like, yeah, I like that. They had cowboy boots, snake skin, I right. boots. So I said, let me get the But I knew where it started from, you know, the streets. Mm-hmm. And now I see the Sicilians. I heard about them on TV. I heard of Al Capone, John Gotti, and all them. Not John Gotti at the time, but right. Lucky Luciano and all them. Now, honestly, I kept pictures of these people without my prison bed I my photo album full of mafia figures I studied wow. it you know what I'm saying my room I had cars Cadillac fleet was on my wall I didn't have women like some kids have women swimsuit models I had what I wanted to get you know my first car was a Fleetwood mm-hmm. you know, and a 6 foot Chevy I had them at the same time <coughs> how old were you I was 15 15 when you when first, you first got locked up no like, when you first got the the, 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 cars. Vehicle, the cars the cars mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. so when you got these cars at 15 years old, uh, how did you end up getting the money to even get the cars? Right. Oh, we was hustling, man, my own boy. We was hustling. How old were you and when you started was hustling? A gift? Well, I guess you can say I started hustling. I started selling candy. Yeah. Selling candy yeah. at school, selling joints when I was in middle school, dollar joints and rag of weed like that. So I started off young. I started everything young. Did, like, they didn't ever catch you in the school selling nah, weed? No. Nah. And your mama didn't wonder where all that money was coming from? No, nah, she ain't never seen nothing like that. But at I 15, you bought, the 15, you bought your first car. I left home. At, I, both people, one of my friends got kicked out because they followed me. I left my home. I never got kicked out. Really? Yeah. That's crazy. So when you left your house, because, again, I'm a parent. Mm-hmm. My child can't leave this house at 15 and say he leaving this house. I'll kill him. I mean, hey, <laughs> my mother's a good Christian woman and everything, but I... Me and my homeboys, we had a house out here by the lake, boats and cars and motorbikes. We was living a good life. At 15? At 15. At 15. Yeah, they was older than me, but I was 15. And Ooh, I was going to do what I was doing. You and know, what part of Oklahoma is it? Was Oklahoma here? City. Oh, yeah, right there in, in, mm-hmm. in the city. Mm-hmm. Did y'all ever, uh, at that age, was anybody coming up to Dallas during that time? I came to Dallas on trips, like when uh, Redbird Mall was really jumping. I used to come here on family trips and all that, but... We never came. We came to steal cars, man. Come on, boys, and all that type of stuff. <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. I've been, like I said, I started a lot of this stuff early. Yeah, you know yeah, saying? yeah. Like, and that's why the city just kind of followed me whenever I did, whatever I did. Yeah, you know Kevin. So, I mean, when you think about just um, uh, uh, times that you could have been killed or times that you could have been taken out as a young man dealing with all this stuff, were there those times as well, or did you guys just always get away scot free? I always got away. What no Police chance of me? Because I you, always got you away. always while slicking them. Yeah, I had twenty cars in three years. I jump out and leave the cars and let them better the car in jail instead of me. Yeah, and so yeah. They, they hated me because he always get away, he always run. Because that ain't mean nothing to me. I can get it just like like that. that. Mm-hmm. Wow. So Oklahoma City, you say the the when you think about country, Oklahoma City back then, the Oklahoma City now is two different places. Oh yeah, most definitely. Because back then it was a little bit more rural, right? No, not really. Because they really ain't built no development. They did it on the white side of town. Now when I got out, when I got out, I actually was riding down the street crying. Because I'm looking like, where I'm from, why? It's still like the ghetto, the Two Shorts, two shorts ghetto video. I'm yeah. like, where we from, they ain't remodeled nothing. They ain't built nothing. But on the other side of town, they got it. Looking nice. Paved streets and everything. But... They ain't did nothing to our side of town. It hurt me because I'm like, all these hustlers I know from back in the 80s, y'all still here. Y'all ain't developed and put nothing in your own community. Mm -hmm. I say, well, stay asleep then. I'm going to get the key to the city. Wow. I'm going to make the uh, grocery stores where we can come. Ain't even no grocery stores where I grew up at to get for the black people to go and shop for food. They there. They you no gotta go to there. the white side. Yeah, you gotta go travel. These people ain't got no cars. But they I ain't, they don't live no. I don't think it's just in Oklahoma, Kevin. No, it's not. When it's you go not. to all of these different cities, that's something mm-hmm. I thrive on. Is going to see, uh, it, you know, black. You, it's, it's very seldom you see a black supermarket, a black bank. We got one literally in my neighborhood, like the one of them pictures I seen when I had the yellow. On. That was a grocery store right in my neighborhood called Red Buzz. It's been nothing for like thirty years or longer. Nothing. And I've seen a guy when I first got who owned it. 
And I walked up to him and said, man, what you doing with this? You storing cars in here. You storing stuff. And this is, what can it do? And he told me, man, whatever you want to do, I'll let you do. If you want to buy this, you want to do this, I'm going to do this for you. I'm like, well, I'll be back with you. Because you hindering our neighborhood from growth. And I hear a lot of um, OGs will say, well, or if they're even in the streets, that, you know what, I make my money, yeah, but I go and I buy stuff and give to the poor, to the, to the kids, to the this, to that, to feed them, clothe mm -hmm. them, help them pay the bills, stuff like that. But with what you're saying, the first thing I think about is none of them actually say, okay, let me open, like you said, a grocery store in this area mm -hmm. for my people. Let me open a business because you need this in your section for my people, and let me show you how to run a business being a black exactly. person but most dope dealers and they don't even know how to run a official legal business in the first place anyway because i always that's one thing i always fight about i'm like if you can run a successful drug business you can run a successful legal business exactly. too but you just refuse not to you well, know when you think about it it, it really not the say the drug dealer uh that comes into a little money i don't see it as being his fault as much as it is the older guy, like we had Mr. Luther, we had a Bubba Lane, we had different people who owned business back 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 when they when they did keep it separate. And they did that purposely when mm -hmm. I was young. So when you think about it now, those guys, they had a business, but then they was tiptoeing as well in their situation because exactly. they knew that it was certain stipulations they wasn't wanting to go up and go up against. Uh when you look at these guys, these these business owners, you know what I mean? Yes, they yes. they didn't they didn't they didn't get out of line. Mm -hmm. They 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 built what they could and respected what they had, but far as educating the other people around them, uh, far as their kids and the people that that they you know basically grew up in the house with them, you don't see them those people. I don't see, envision as having businesses now. See, not all of them. Now a few, but it's very low percentage. Yeah, very low. One of the things I wrote in my book, A Letter to Princess Tonight, was when we grew up, we never was taught. The white people, they taught their kids allowance. They gave them that. We go, mama, I ain't got no money, I ain't got no money. So we never knew how to manage money. We never, we ain't getting no credit. We don't have no credit. Thing was a bad thing. The world has ran off of that. The white people had credit. When their kids turn 18, they give them a new car with credit. Their credit is already established. We were never taught to handle money. So when we drug dealers, we get the money, we blow it. Yeah. We never was taught how to manage the money and how to do this, how to do that. So that's one of our problems. We, we don't teach our kids from the gate. Here goes some money. Learn this, say this, do that, and teach them the art of managing money. So, I don't think all of the white kids either are taught that either. No, not they, all of them. Because the reason I say that because they get a a lot of times different cultures, not just people that don't look like us. Because mm -hmm. it's not just white. Exactly. Um, it can be Indian. It can be any race. It can be Jamaican. It can be in, when you brought up in a situation. A lot of this is taught because of things like business and so on. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, a lot of times these people are, are, are basically taught to work, a mm -hmm. lot of them. They go into laboring. Exactly. You see what I'm saying? Exactly. They teach them how to be laborers a mm -hmm. lot of time because that's what they're doing. So like you said, your mom worked at General Motors or whatever. Mm -hmm. In her mind, she would teach you what she's doing to get by. So she'd be like, you gotta find your good job. And mm -hmm. you see what I'm saying? Because that's what she knows has, has brought her the success to take mm -hmm. care of you guys. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Same as, as a lot of people that work for different companies. Uh, that company will never be theirs, but white, black, Indian, whoever, if they have something that's working for them, they're going to teach it to their children. Exactly. And would it also depend on the generation that we're in? Because when I say that, like now you have a lot more black um, businesses that appear compared to what used to be back in the day and because of that you have those parents might be trying to tell their kids although the kids might not want to do it but they're educated to know that i can own my own business i can run my own business and this is how i can do it okay. and i remember back some older people back in the days would tell me um like in certain cities that you went to you would have predominantly black businesses running the, the town mm -hmm. but it's not like that now but back then it was and i'm sure that they would have train their kids to know how to do it is just for them to either take it over and do it or not. Yeah. You know? Yeah. yeah. So it comes and goes. Yeah. I, I like I said, I, I really I think that with today's society, I think we're in a much better place. I think a lot of those rappers and entrepreneurs that you see out here, it's a blessing 
that they've able they've been able to change their generations for their the Beyonces, the Jay Zs, the Kanyes, and all of the the futures, the people who deal with the rap and the Robert Smiths to deal with uh, software uh, remanufacturing. Mm -hmm. When you see these type of elite, the Mayweathers, you know what I mean. Um, you you still these guys are doing things that have never been done before in the black community. Exactly. So we got to give them a big ups for that. The Jay Princes as well. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, to be able to maintain uh, entrepreneurship and so longevity as long, long, long as they have with, with them. Those rooms were not easy for them either. No. No. You see, to go into those rooms and to be able to be uh, accepted Respected in those rooms, we think a lot of times just because they got money now, it was easy. The Dr. Dre's, it wasn't easy to get in those rooms. And if you watch their story and you went talk to them, all of them would have a similar story. That's why my thing is I'm a survivor of genocide. And not just about me going to prison, being a gamer. There's that everybody, like I said, Kyrie Irving, Kanye West, Jay-Z, uh, Tupac, any, everybody went through this because they had a foot on our neck. They grew up as a black man in America just like I did. Exactly. They had opportunity and they took advantage of it. That's right. And they had support and they used like they utilized them. Like, like you say, Dr. Dre and uh, Jay Prince. Jay Prince been fought the federal system for so many years. That's right. Now, whatever's going on with him and his son, now they're trying to they're gonna use that to try to bring him down. Cause you could never mess with him the way you wanted to back whenever he was uh living like he was living. No, one hundred percent. I I in my and, and you know, when you think about uh just you, when you first got in trouble and had to deal with the uh, legal system, what did they catch you on? Was it was it car theft? Was my, it drugs? My, my first charge ever when I got caught, my partner came, rest in peace, he's sleeping. Pippi, he came by my house. My mother was in Vegas going out of town. And he had a, uh, and it's kind of goofy, that's really how lame I was. I was probably 12 or 13 or something. He said he got a check. Let's go down and cast, cast these checks. So me and my other home would go with him. I'm little, I've always been a little guy. I go to the check casting place with the guy, sit in there. The people say, when was you born? I say, in 50-something. <laughs> Oh, wow. Man, they called the police so quick on us. So I'm like, you're going to police. So I'm in my home, let's go. So we break out the door, but the police catch us. And my other homeboy drove off because, like, now I'm so. That was my first time ever getting caught in my first charge of forgery. Yeah. So that was that. And I, my homeboy mother come get us out. We go home. I'm glad because my mother was out of town and they picked us up and got us out. And so your mother didn't find out about it? Yeah, when I had to go to court. <laughs> <laughs> so when you went to court, did they throw it out because you were so young? No, I was juvenile. And they go through the procedure, put you on probation and all that type of stuff. But I did that, and that was my first time. And after that, I really never got did caught you, to the big time. You lived the, the, the probation now? Yeah, yeah. Well, how old were you when you when you first faced your real serious? Uh, 18 years. 18 years? Eighteen. How old were you, 18 years old? 18 or? years old. And what was that case about? And let me talk about the cribbing first, because you somehow got yourself caught up in the feeling like mm -hmm. you was a crib. Oh, yeah. I don't, I used like, you to see what I'm saying? Like, this mm -hmm. is, and I, I have these conversations all the time with all of the the Texas and Oklahoma bangers and, 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 and represent Houston, representing streets that, that Ice Cube said, represent a street that you ain't never even heard of. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, so I mean, how did how did you guys end up representing uh, 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 the Crip life? Was it what game? Was it Five Deuce? Was it? No, I'm from Shotgun Crip. Shotgun Crip. I never I heard of that. Never heard of that one. California. Out of Gardenia. Yeah. So how did you end up being with Shotgun Crip? My stepfather from Gardenia, California. And he brought it to you? No, nah, he wasn't a game banger at all. I learned about the Crips when I was at lunch. You know, my family was from uh, Compton, Mona Park. So I learned about uh, the game bang when I was a youngster. I said, you used oh, to visit? I studied it. Did yeah, you visit? visit. Y'all go to Cali? Visit. Yeah, yeah. In you we brought it back. That, I'm the, I started this in Oklahoma. Man. You started it in Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. So when you came back, you, you start telling them about the Crip. Well, I told them about it. I, like I say, I was it's like in 82 since I've been representing the Crips. And uh, some more people came, and my partners came from Garden to California with my step All of them trans. L.A., General Motors closed down in L.A. Okay. And they came to Oklahoma. My stepfather, oh. my uncle and everybody, this and that. So his sons, my homeboy's friends came in. So I just, we hooked up like that. So we've been doing it ever since. So Oklahoma now, there is a place there where people always know that if you go over to this neighborhood, uh -huh. this is where the Crips going to be at. Oh, yeah. I remember one time when I was young, people don't even know these stories. My mother might know it, but. 
it was some gangs that got busted over there in the Spencer, the country area. I think some Bloods or something. They was like, oh, the gangs from L.A. is coming over home. Woody, woo, woo. I went and put a sign out across from my house and put the crib live here. You know what I'm saying? Uh-huh. <laughs> my mom said, you better go get that sign from over there. What? <laughs> So you want to let them yeah, know. Yeah, I'm letting them know. Hey, man, I've been with this. The Oklahoma just don't know. You know, yeah. my family's Crips out in L.A. So, yeah. you know what I'm saying? The OG originals. I ain't going to say their name, but, you know, they Grape Street. They Bounty Hunters. They Comptons. They everything, you know. One thing I always wonder, how, like, you say you were a Crip. Are you, you know, how do you just join? You just get up at one day and say, okay, I'm I'm going to be cribbish. a Crip. I'm going to oh, start no, it. No. These are the rules. Da, da, da. Oh, I, I heard about all of no, but, yeah. back then, but back then, how you did gotta, you yeah. get into you gotta being get a Crip? Like this. So you went to, when you went to L.A., you went to L.A., and you said, I wanted to be a part of this organization. No. Then what did you do? Man, I can't tell you how I got put on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that just. Okay, you know. but can you say this then? Did you join in L.A., and then you brought it here, or did mm-hmm. you come here and join? You brought it, Okay. Okay. I know my, one of my big homeboys, he was telling me riding through there, because we put the drugs throughout the city. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? In the 80s, we had control of the city. Right. But wasn't no shotguns. And he tell me one day, we riding the Cadillac. you like, man, you have all these people claiming shotgun. Or I said, hey, if I will. And then before I know it, because that's my neighborhood. He ain't from there, my right. neighborhood, but I am. And I be damned. He mm. was right. Everybody claims shotgun. I mean, everybody. That's my neighborhood. You ain't got no choice. You can't be nothing else from over there. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. So how long, and here we go again, because I talked to uh, Melvin Farmer. I talked to Tolomar. I, I, you've seen him if you watch mm-hmm. my show. Yeah, I, I deal with the ones who originally started it mm-hmm. and who started uh, 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 A Trey and was, was with Tookie and they all, mm-hmm. this whole situation. So how do you live it till you die? You're born in it and you die in it? Or do you get an age to where you start? Because when it first started, cripping was something that they take to a different place and said it's uh something that's supposed to help their people. It's something to help exactly. the community. That's what it's the about. community. That's what the community. Media. Yeah. What is it? Re- community revolution in progress. See, the people society makes it negative. Mm-hmm. You know, like they came up with drive-by shoes. I never did no drive-by. But the media did. It got these kids thinking, oh, I got to do this to be down. That was That's wrong. That's why I don't like the media perpetrating, cause like when they say, like my, like in the nineties, they had a big movement of kidnapping kids. The media was p- piping, making these people think, oh, I gotta go do this, and they already mental far as they mind state, cause you mm-hmm. gonna go out and kidnap kids, something gotta be wrong with you. So the media boosted them. They had a, the whole thing through. I'm sitting in prison. Why? I'm like, man, look at this. The media steady blowing, blowing smoke and making kids. Not even kids, but older people do these type of things. So I'm like, I ain't never did no drive-by shooting. Now, if you ran into the house and I was busting on you, that's another thing. I ain't going to ride past your house and shoot right. your house up. But you see, another th- reason why I asked you, you know, how did you get in- initiated and all of that? Because as people join and um, create their own other places, I would think that if the structure is passed down properly, it would have stayed what the true meaning mm-hmm. should have been instead of, you know, I'm just going to get up and start this and we're going to start this and rep this but not go through the proper channels of doing so. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, see, like I said, I didn't know, I ain't no off-brand from uh, the original. The most, what I see in America when it comes to the Crips and Bloods, it's only a few states that really mimic L.A. And mm-hmm. that's Oklahoma, Kansas City, and I, I may say... I don't even know about Georgia and Texas. Some people may, but some people don't. You know what mm-hmm. I'm saying? Because this, like, if you grew up with these certain individuals from this other side of town, they are a different gang. They ain't going to hold true to what it's supposed to be. Mm-hmm. Like in Oklahoma, when we put it down here, it ain't no, I used to grow up with you. I'm going to kill you anyway. <laughs> you know what mm-hmm. I'm saying? No, because you from somewhere else. That so just, if the true meaning of Crip is supposed to be you helping your community, back then when you joined, what did you do to help your community? Oh, I use, like I said in my book. Back then. When you have a power, like I'm, like I'm explaining it to my daughter in the book, when you have a power influence over people, make sure you use it in a positive way. I use mine in a negative way. When I was, I was only 15, 16 years old, I had 90 soldiers up under me. They was all tight on my stomach. And that's when you had okay. joined, that's when you were a No, nah, that's when I'm 
He leading it. I'm, I'm the leader. Right. And I got 90 people up under me. Right. But I'm young and wild. I'm not educated like I am now. So I'm just, oh, you got to go put in some work. You got to hold this down. This, we protect our neighborhood. Not knowing selling drugs and this is going to destroy families, mothers and kids right. that's on drugs. I don't know none of this. I'm just 16. I ain't live long. But now I know better mm-hmm. than to make this household incomplete by taking their mother out, their father out, and turning them into a junkie. Like I said in my book, if I had used my power in a positive way to be more black-owned businesses, it would be more black successful people in my neighborhood than junkies, drug addicts, and dope houses. Yeah, but you know that now, and a lot of times we say, how can we change narrative with these younger kids? But when you look at the younger kids, they're the same as how you were when you were a kid, as in hot-headed, you couldn't, can't tell them nothing. You, you know, you're not making this type of money I am. Money is what, to me, change people in, in a sort of way, as in like, you can't talk to me, you ain't got what I have. Well, see, now the kids nowadays is wrong. When we said, we listen to older men, older when we listen, they don't listen now. Like, when I'm in prayer, I'm like, these dudes don't want to listen. They just came out their mother's womb 20 years ago, 18 years ago, but you know everything. So it, so when you were on the street and you had all them 90 people under you and you was doing your thing, you had all that money and everything, if an older person had stepped to you and told you what you're doing right here is going to destroy your community, you need to take it and do this, this, and this, you tell me at that point in your time, go back and think about it, would you have done differently? Well, I don't, I don't know if I would have done it differently, but since I was the first one, to, to put this game, Oklahoma didn't know nothing about no games. I was an example. So no one ever can do that. Now the older men with money, they'll run from us. They might think we're trying to rob them. They was at the Crips, like you say, they say we country or whatever. Mm-hmm. These older dudes ain't never seen nothing like this before. They thinking, we got to stay away from these young men. But when I got to prison, that's why I, y'all committing genocide. Then said, man, get out of old school. You ain't talking about nothing. Did it not come. But now I understand. Could, could you just uh, take us through... Um, just the fact of, of what caused you to go to prison when you, uh, and how long was it? I went down for 15 years in the state. The first time? First time. 15 years in the uh, state. 18 to 33. What, we gotta, get, just tell me what happened to cause you to be in prison. What were you convicted well, for? I was convicted for robbery, kidnapping, um, robbery, kidnapping, two robberies, kidnapping. And what it was, Not- something happened, one of my partners, they didn't, I just took the fall. I told him it was me. I ain't never got caught. I was had a dope case anyway, so I just tell I'm going down. You only I just took the fall for him, for him and a few more people that committed it. They gave me a hundred and some years for it. They gave you a hundred and some years. Yeah. A couple thirty five, I think three thirty five, a ten, a one, and a five. Wow, and and mm-hmm. so you were just basically staying loyal to the people that rock with you, mm-hmm. leading by example. You know, you don't tell on nothing. You know, I, I seen when they come in the court, they can identify me. They were looking for him. But he left out the courtroom, but never came in, really. So they were looking for him. They didn't, but the DA told him, like, say it's him, because they wanted me so bad. And so she said, yeah, that's him. I, so I told him, yeah, it's me anyway. And I just played. So they called you for one thing, but then they end up convicting you for several things mm-hmm. while you they were They added up. it on, added charges on to me just to boost the time up. We had crooked lawyers, I mean, DAs up in uh, Oklahoma City at that time. They just They crazy. just want a conviction. Mm-hmm. They was worried about people coming from out of LA gangs. We had one guy, Bob Macy. He's dead now. He's telling people, if you don't ex- convict these people from LA or whatever, I'm going to jump out this window. Mm. Now, now, how is that justice? He tell the jury that. And he did it. He was known for it. And they wiped them people out. Now, many people. I got a gang of homeboys that's been in jail for him. And then when he died, they come out and found he crooked. And him and this lady, black lady, George Gilchrist. And she was his flunky. She used fake samples up. Got one of my homeboys on death row in 170 years on a murder. And uh, she was his co-conspirator. When he died, that's when they brought it out to her. She ran. They ran out here to Texas somewhere. She was on news reports and all that, and just blackballed her. You know. So it was it was a crooked system back then when it comes to the streets. Yeah. So. But so you you go in you first when you first get to prison or when you how long did you stay in the county? Uh, like nine nine months. Nine months. Mm-hmm. You first you you never been to prison before. Mm-hmm. You you get sent you in the state. What mm-hmm. was the name of the prison that you first went I to? Went to James Crabtree. James Crabtree, and that's where. How long did you stay there? 
don't know. I don't think I stayed there long because some gang banging stuff came down. They shipped me because they figured I was a leader. So they, I didn't have nothing to do with it. But they just got rid of me. So how long did you stay there? About a year? Six months? I'm going to say like eight, nine months. Eight, nine months. Mm-hmm. The next location you go. Well, how was it, though, when you first went to prison? Like, did they they, did they try did, did they try to fear, put, use fear tactics, the guards and all that? No, no, no. My so that's first different. day, off, when I get off the bus, I pulled up. My homeboy was already there. He'd been down there for a minute. And some more homeboys was there. And they greeted me when I got off the bus. When young dudes, I didn't know who they was. They talked to me, gave me. I'm like, where my homeboy at? I went over there, hollered at him. And it was just, back then, it was just like like Ice Cube said, just like a class reunion. Yeah. You know, see all the people that you been gone. You know, some homeboy been gone for a shooting for probably a year or two. Yeah. And I, he was right there. And I'm like, what's going on with this bill? And these dudes was radical, some youngsters, thinking they finna clink up with me to go get this other homeboy. I'm like, hold up. No, nah, I'm finna go out at the homie, man. I ain't, whatever y'all got going on is what y'all got going on. I ain't with that. So it was sm- so they knew who you was. They knew. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. They knew you was about that life. Yeah, most definitely. But then they, but they, but you told them, uh, "Pump your brakes." I'm trying to see because yeah, I didn't know them. Yeah, correct. You know what I'm they knew you, but you didn't know them. Yeah, yeah. They, they, my homies from Hoover in that, but I didn't know them, and I'm not finna just st- fresh off the bus. I'm fresh. They even put my bags on the bunk. And they, even, they even trying to get another homeboy who was saying was a buster. I should did that before I got here. <laughs> <laughs> so when you okay, but then they catch you up in all the stuff that starts to happen, all the all mm-hmm. the all the banging stuff that's going on. Mm-hmm. They they say you one of the main contributors, so they ship you out. Mm-hmm. Now you go to this next unit. Is it more like a suitable place to where it was way Connors, Dick Connors. It was Connors and Granite was the ones that was really rocking and rolling. Besides McAllister. So when you got off there, what was the difference in being at that one versus the one you had just left? Shoot, we had more homies there. More homies? <laughs> we was more, more organized homies. or no? Yeah, yeah, it was more organized. And the homie I was there with at the first place, <coughs> he was he was there. So we all... They had shipped him just, already. Yeah, so we, it, see, it was like, we was a whole bunch of, everybody from the streets, we knew. It was like 15 of us there. Was, was it more racial wars going on during that time? Or what, as far as blacks against the whites or the Hispanics? Or was it just black on black? Or how was it rolling over there? Just Cripping Bloods with me. Oh, it was Cripping Bloods. Because the white boys, they were never really nothing to they were, because And then they had the Indians. But I never knew what that meant, IBH. At the time, I just seen it on the walls, but I never knew it would. But now in the 2000s, so when I got out, oh, that's what that meant. Yeah. Because they weren't really nothing. Now they killing blacks and everything. and. Mm. So they had a gang. And, they, and how old was you when you left? When I got out, I was 33. No, when you went. Went 18. 18. By the time you turned 25, mm-hmm. does reality set in that, hey, man, I done did some damn time? and and Are or, or, or you still in that mindset of whatever, anything goes? Always and, anything goes. I ain't never got out of that. You know, yeah. It's just, you know, it ain't never got out of that because who I am and what I am. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You'll never slip and put your guard down like that but and then like you say I'm in there with my people and we in there we doing what we doing it's like I don't even like to say that stuff but the yards I was on it's either they run the yard the whites the Mexican the Crips the Bloods or we run it I'm never gonna let them run it so I ran the yards where I was at I had the drugs and had the power every time everywhere I go wow and so you you do uh, 15 years Mm -hmm. Solid fifteen. Mm-hmm. I, when you when, and we'll I'll fast forward to your release of that fifteen. But when you got out, when you when they came to you and said you you made parole or something, I discharged. They turned me down nine times. You discharged on, on a yeah. on a hundred and some years. They gave me hundred years, ran it together to a thirty five. Okay, broke it down to a twenty one in fourteen out. Twenty one in fourteen out. Okay, mm-hmm. and you did you did. 15, 15 on that 21. On that 21. Mm-hmm. And so you come out. What are your plans when you come out? Well, when I came out to the uh, state, my plans, gee, that was so long ago. <laughs> but but the one thing we can't, we got to keep in mind is you was married to the same woman that you married to. Oh, yeah. To we, this I got day. married in 2004. While you was locked up? Mm-hmm. My, I got locked up in California for a couple months before I got, they supposed to expedite me back to Oklahoma. So when I got out, from there and came back, I was only out 30 days and they locked, called me and locked me up. And so 
our plans was to get married then in 91. So I how long did. did you, did you, was this like a high school sweetheart? Did you know her like long before you got married or? No, we, I, she was, no, no, high, we didn't go to high school. I, I met her when I was, no, I met her and I was in the streets with her. I had my son. I got locked up the day before my son was uh, term one. So you've so, known, you knew her for a while we before, 15. since you were 15. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. When we got married in 2004, when we was, how old that makes us. And she knew that you were going to be gone for a, a while. She rode with me throughout my 15 years. And so when you came home when, in 15 years, she was there. She basically, uh, you paroled out to your house, mm -hmm. went home. What was what was the plan? I'll go back to that. The plan? I'm always going to be an entrepreneur, a businessman. I Even during that, that time? That, yeah, period, because I don't know how to work for nobody. Yeah. It's, it's, you got the entrepreneurial spirit, you're going to have it, and you, you can let the society take it from you. And to me, that's a no-no, but it ain't never been why I got to go work for somebody. That's just not my makeup. So- when when you get out, how long do you stay out before you hit this other bump in the road? I was out for actually thirty months exactly. And thirty three of the months, months was on the run from the feds. Three of the months. Mm -hmm. Thirty months. That's okay. About two, two, and year, two and a half years. Two and a half, two and a half exactly. years. But okay, so I gotta go back because I'm a female, mm -hmm. and when she held you down this whole time. Um, because I've heard scenarios. I, I know people who hold people down, mm -hmm. but they'll still go on with their life while they're out here. When I say go on, I mean relationships, do whatever. Mm -hmm. um, was she that person where she held you down straight or she still moved on and you understood? And then once you came home, that was what it was. Yeah, I mean, She might not have moved on, but she had experience, I'm pretty sure, 15 okay. years. I don't never expect no person not to encounter sexual uh, okay. whatever. Cheating to me is when you get your heart away. Yeah. Okay. You know what I'm saying? You can do what you must with your body because it's yours. I can't control. That's like a control thing. But she ain't never let me. My kids came to see me with her always. I ain't never went without. She never let me. Kids, no, most women, like I say, my friend, we went down. My homeboy, he had a life. Life without him. And his baby mother is my friend, best, my wife's best friend. Mm -hmm. And all my other friends, they one was wasn't there. So I'm the only one going to visit. They ain't. So I got to give her that. Because mm -hmm. she, you know, she could be like them. She, she ain't never abandoned me. You right. know, so that counts for what it is. You know what I really wanted, wanted you to say that, too, because mm -hmm. I know a lot of people who um, I've heard of cases where the man would be so upset, although she hold him down, sending money, do all the mm -hmm. things that you're talking about. But he would be mad that you, you know, you're doing other stuff with your body that you shouldn't be doing. You, you need to wait mm -hmm. the whole 20 years mm -hmm. on me and da, 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 whatever. They selfish. You can't control a person like that because they wouldn't do it. Mm -hmm. That's real. No, I ain't um, wouldn't do it. So, so you... You hit another bump in the road. What is the, what is the, what what happened? Another distribution. Okay. Because that's what that boils to. And Secret indictment? No, just a distribution. And uh, the indictment came when they swooped up my neighborhood. You know what I'm saying? I guess they already had something going on before I got out. And I was just was an added bonus to it. Who yeah. I am and what I am. And my little cousin set me up. You know, I call myself helping him out all along. He was working for the people. Wow. Uh, so he came to court on you? No, no, he didn't come to court. Me and my other partner, we was the last ones going to trial. I could play guilty the week before trial because my lawyer wasn't going to fight for me. Yeah. It was his first law, uh, case as a uh, federal uh, attorney. He was trying to make deals with the DA. So you could get up there in the ladder. <laughs> well, you can fire him at that point and get somebody else? Mm -hmm. You couldn't fire him um, and get somebody else at that trial. time? It was like you say, it was so many people related to that case. It was like 30 some people that on my homeboys in case. So all the lawyers in this law firms is 30. Anything else is a conflict of interest. Mm -hmm. So you can't get lawyer. Like one of my partners got a life. But they didn't come. Lawyer. They came at you with different stuff at first. So when they first came to you, what did they come oh, with? They no, they don't come with you, no deals and nothing like that. Oh, so they basically had how much they wanted you to do? Yeah, they want, my only, mine was five to 40. Okay, how much did they I offer? I got thirteen eight. They didn't offer me nothing. They wanted me to get down on my partner or I'll be in jail. And I wasn't going to do that. So you end up doing another? 12 years. 12 years. That made me 27 years in prison. 27. So 13 years. How was the feds different from the state and how they treated you? The feds is 
bogus. I don't know what the rappers and people say. The state is way better than the feds. The feds full of fake people. <laughs> okay. You know, Elaborate. I, I mean, the dudes in there, is, they ain't fake. You got real killers in the state. <laughs> you got people in the, the feds is weenies to me. Yeah. Mm. You know what I'm saying? They hide behind the politics and this and that. Da, 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 da. I never even heard of none of that. And so I went to the feds. I'm like, they used to try to convert me to a, a state person, a fair person. I'm not learning. I know how to do time. I'm doing it the way I was raised. Yeah. And this is, no, I'm not talking about, if I get into it with you, I got to ask somebody to come and fight you. I'm not doing no stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> with you. If you get into it with them, I got to help you do that, man. I don't even know you. I'm not into no crip cars and stuff like that. You so, know what I'm saying? Just, so how did it, so, so the gang, so, so the crip, uh, the 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 fact of being who you were as a crip mm -hmm. going to the fed there were not other there had to be other crips there. yeah it was a whole bunch of crips and you can link up with them but they were they were trying to do the same thing they was doing in that whole uh, situation for as the way they operated in the federal system politics the politics no they was politics I guess I ain't never heard about to me police do politics when I yeah. grew up so I didn't I don't know what that was and like I say the politics where they Dudes is trying to control how you move. You, I'm a grown man, man. You can't tell. Like that time, I'm 36, 35, 36. You can't tell me. They're trying what to, to keep do. structure, really, what they were trying to do. Break down the 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 paperwork party thing for me. Mm -hmm. What was because you seen it your way. I see how he thinks. See, he his own man. He gonna tell these people that come in and they saying they doing a paperwork, paperwork party to check what they were yeah, coming in for. What was that all about for you? Well, to me, I. <laughs> I never really, I seen it and I witnessed it, but some people, they might got two sets of paperwork. You know what I'm saying? They might got this one saying they good. The other one is what they own today. And I don't know. <laughs> to be, You're I the never, first I can't, person I, can't, I heard say that. I can't, Nobody I can't, said that's what I, knew. I, can't, I can't understand it because it's like, okay, you didn't tell it in 2000, and, I will say 1999, but I met you in 2018. But you working with the police here. You a threat to me now. I didn't know you in 99. So I don't care what you do. You a police today. You talking to lieutenants. You running, telling, you busting people in the yard. The people say that 90% of the people told it in the feds and the 10% wish they had. And I'm like, Charlie, it's, it's bogus 90% to me. told it in the feds. Mm -hmm. For sure. Mm -hmm. And 10% wish they had. Yeah. It's like I grew up in the state. I saw drugs in the state prison to support my family because this time I'm in prison I'm not I'm still a father correct I'm still so I don't never drop my responsibilities I'm a, I ain't made over the minimum was $20,000 a year I made yeah. in the state so I make this money here. I come to the fair I didn't sell a motherfucker nothing because I don't trust you people no no there. no I guess I'm gonna smoke it I'm not <laughs> gonna sell you dudes nothing because I don't trust them I see them yeah, yeah. You know, but I can't knock nobody. Whatever you do is what you do, man. But but they had like when the feds, uh, these guys are the ones with the money and uh, no the, man. They got people in there for selling rocks for bullets. That's what I thought. <laughs> these people is low life smokers and everything up in there. I'm like, come on, man. <laughs> no, it's blowed up high. Now maybe they went in the '80s. That's why I say all this politic paperwork. All that maybe worked in eight, but the new breed of people came in now. It's not what it is. So man. when you got there, they didn't check your paperwork? Did you have to go through all of that? <laughs> well, my partners, they knew me. And so, yeah, they helped me with my law library. You know, yeah, helped me bite my case. <laughs> so, yeah. Oh, no, no. I'm talking about and because from the way how everybody who's sitting in that seat and the way how they talk, they, they make it sound like everybody you who gotta comes in. You got to get your paperwork checked. To your first people. Thing, to your to, people. To your people or to anybody in there, whoever is the head. <laughs> I ain't had no head. That's why I have, but my homeboys, that's where you give your paperwork to. To your homeboys. And they, they check it out. But oh, okay. But not, they already not knew, just anybody. But they already knew you, so yeah. you didn't have to give them your paperwork. No, he helped me with my law library. He helped me do my work, my own You're trying to my fight head. to get your life to get, to get out. out. To get out, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, he checked it. He looked at it, but he know me. Car case on the news. And <laughs> he wanted, so he know. You know, so I don't know. Yeah, yeah, it wasn't no thing to wear. It was just you can just walk any up and say, hey, man, no, nah, they can't do I'm that because they do board. that. You do that and you're wrong. Now you got a problem. Mm -hmm. So you can't just walk up and say, man, let me see your paperwork. Because mm -hmm. he show you his paperwork and he's right. And now you got a problem. Wow. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, so you hear you when you think about different people, they this paperwork thing. I, I you didn't hear about. You heard about it a lot, like when Ti 
uh, talked about it, about the fact that, man, you had to have a paperwork party when you go down mm-hmm. here. And, uh, mm-hmm. You know, uh, people know you, you know, if I snitched, it'll be there. Mm-hmm. They'll know it, you know. Um, I just, you know, when you think about it from that aspect, you start hearing everybody start chiming in about paperwork party, paperwork mm-hmm. party. I've heard, I've had people here mm-hmm. uh, to talk about it, and it's just something to where I think it's become something that's kind of maybe a little popularized. Yeah, that's what it is. It's you probably see, that's I, why say the rappers and stuff got this fed stuff glamour rap because it ain't like they say it's you like you in a crip car. You got to bring your paperwork to be a part of that. Yeah, you got to be a blood. You got to be a uh, Mexican, Pisces, and all that. They want to check your shit and make sure you're okay. Yeah, that's what they. That's what that is now. I, the party, I don't know. I heard of that before, but I don't. That's just people. I don't know. I don't know about that. But I just know about the. Like I don't say check in, but you don't hear it. Trey Good, see what see what it is. Da da da. He good. He straight and do fun. That's it. Do you um? So when you get locked up that next time, I mean, your wife, she still just say I'm with you no matter what. She down. Yeah. The second time. Yeah, she was with me. It's the same scenario again. You know, she with me and may did whatever she done throughout the time. But I don't know. I ain't keeping score. I just. Stay down. That's all. What I about know. your kids? How how do you feel like your son? It was your son, right? Mm-hmm. My son how, and my daughter. And you're not a baby girl. Two okay. my youngest girl. I had her when you I got, got out. You got a two year old right now? No, she's fifteen. That's the letter to Princess Shania. That's the that's book Shania. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So the book is this. Where can we get these books, man? Because I, I oh, Amazon. A letter to Princess store. Shania. I like this book. I'm gonna. Is this mine? No, you can have it. See, I had to take it from me. I got to take this. <laughs> you can. Have, that's yeah. really my workbook. I have my back when I go do things, but I've okay. always got more. Yeah, because I definitely, uh, I definitely keep these books. Mm-hmm. This is the show you've been on, Boss Talk One Hundred One, man. Yeah. Uh, so when you wrote this book, what, what you were you locked up when you wrote this? Yeah, that's when I wrote it when I was in the feds to her. And to be honest, that's my favorite book. I can't read without crying. Really, it's an emotional roller coaster. And. The garden block is what everybody know because they into the gangs and street life and all that. And that's what is popular. But the letter to Princess Chanel, I say that's the one Oprah want to talk to me about. So mm-hmm. Hold on. You wrote this book, you knew, did, did you give it to her right away? No. I sent it home before I got it finished. And they, my sister, say she was crying. She read my sister, they got to crying and this and that. And that's what I want because it's thought provoking and like I say, emotional roller coaster. Wow, I can't wait to read it. That's hard right there. I wrote it because most men think it's about raising the son, but the daughter needs their father figure as well. And, you know, that's, and I'm sitting there going through another transition in my life, and she was a baby. Like I said, well, I locked up the day before my son turned one. Yeah. I got locked up when she was finna be two. So I really said, I can't have them on kids. I always go to jail when I kids. So <laughs> Come on, kids. this time you weren't trying to hear it. <laughs> no, I don't want no more kids. I got grandkids now, so I'm Did good. you ever sit down and ask her how did it affect her, um, you being locked up for that long while, you know, she was growing yeah, up? I, I asked her, and then, but she's not open like that. She's not. She's my identical. She more of me than my son is, to be honest. Sound Do you like think cool. it affected her? Yeah, I know it has. It got to be. Wow. But you say it didn't affect you when your daddy wasn't even around. I know it. But she's so, a woman. She might be sensitive. <laughs> and he said she's more like you. It might not have affected her. I don't her. know. That's why I say I don't know. Whenever she can open up and talk. She ain't. She read the book one time, I think. She called and was asking about it. And I'm like, what? She found it reading. Because she didn't read it, I guess, called from her first time reading it. I know when I got was at the halfway house and I was here, one day I was going I said, before I published it, I said, let me read it with her. I'm sitting on the bed, and, and we both cry. Everybody cry. You know what I'm saying? Because I'm like, dang, I'm trying to. She was acting, I don't want to say bad. I can't remember exactly what it was, but I needed to get it to her right then. I couldn't wait till I already got out. Because right. I couldn't wait till I got out. But I said, no, nah, we got to read this right now. Because it's a guidelines to what you need to be doing. So now you're my princess. One day you'll be a queen. Mm-hmm. So that's what it's about. Man, d- dope, man. So a letter to Princess Shania by Kevin Mumford Sr., man. It's hard, man. So uh, Kevin Mumford Jr., what's up with him? Oh, he's good, man. He, he, like I said, he's just like me as well. Like I said, he's a great father, brother. 
Because he's about 35. No, he's 32. 32. 32. He, like I said, he on his way down and right now with his, my grandson, Kevin the Third. They coming to uh, Texas. They got a football tournament. My grandson is, I don't even like telling people because maybe you think your kid try to amp him up. But I'm going to tell you like this. You my son, you ain't shit. You ain't shit. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah. my grandson, he's a hell of a football player. I mean, every game I go to, he made three touchdowns every single game. Wow. Every game. He's like, how old back. is he? I think he. Why you put me on the spot? <laughs> I don't know. I'm like my grandma. I don't know the ages. I think he probably eight. He yeah. might be eight. Love to play football. If not, he'd be eight January the 27th. He'd be wow. eight. Wow. Mm. Love to he play. He'd play everything. He's played soccer. I got camera footage of him on soccer. He's he's an athlete. He's a he's an athlete. Hell of a guy, man. Wow. He don't know he get it from me though. <laughs> <laughs> Grandpa. Man. Mm -hmm. So when you when you came home, you got to meet him. But he was locked yeah. you was locked up yeah. when he was now born. No, my grandkids was born. Wow. Mm -hmm. How was that? It was wonderful, man. You they would send you me. pictures and stuff. Mm -hmm. They come visit me all the time. They said, and I'm in the visiting one time. My granddaughter said, Papa, I'm sitting waiting to use the restroom in line. Papa, I'm like, hey, Papa, I'm like, oh, you talking to me? Because <laughs> <laughs> I, I ain't used to hearing that. And I'm like, dang, you tripping. What's up? What you want? She was trying to ask me something. But I ain't never heard nobody calling me that. Let me let me just say this, man. When uh, Larry Hoover Jr., uh, he come on the show, mm -hmm. uh, Larry Hoover, his dad, uh, been locked up for 50 years now, might as well, 49 to 50 mm -hmm. years. He never got to see him outside of prison, mm -hmm. you know, and, and cause I always, when I talk to people, I try to think of everybody's situation and I'll be like, okay, there's another case out here. Like you got to mm -hmm. see your kids. You got to hold mm -hmm. your grandkids. You got to be with them outside of those walls. Larry Hoover has never exactly. seen his kids, his grandkids. He got, what, Larry got 15, one fifteen for show. He got two daughters, too. I think he did too. get to see Larry Jr. No, he got to see him, but be outside of prison yeah, with not him. not outside of prison. He has never been outside yeah, no, of prison no, with no, him. No. He ain't seen his son, who is Larry Hoover Jr., mm -hmm. yeah. outside of prison walls. Mm -hmm. So for you to be walls, able right. to see, you know what I mean, yeah. to be here today, mm -hmm. to be able to experience that, uh, that's that, that's a blessing in itself. Mm -hmm. No, definitely. And I know you know some other yeah. people like My that as well. Boy, they same way. Same way. Same way. Once I saying they daughters is by my wife's friend or whatever. They ain't never got that. One of them is pregnant with her. I think she just told me the other day she's going to have a baby in January. And that's his daughter. And wow. she got a couple grandkids. He ain't, he ain't got to see none of them. What he, kind of words of encouragement? Uh, he ain't got to see none of them? I mean, not outside the wall. Yeah. They may see him on the on phones the, or some stuff like that, but nah, they don't. Mm -mm. What kind and of encouraging it, words do you give them because they, you know they all connected mm -hmm. to you? Them your homeboys from yeah, your kids. Really my cousins. Yeah, yeah. your cousins. Mm -hmm. What what kind of encouraging words do you give A to them and B to, to the ones who are on the outside? I'll tell them like they know. I live for them. Even my yeah. family, when my cousins, our family members die, I put their burden on my back. I got to be successful for y'all. Because most of the time, and I don't, I beat myself, but people think I'm hard on other people, my kids and everybody, but I'm way hard on myself yeah. than I am someone else because – I look at if it wasn't for me, y'all might not be in there with no life sentence. Y'all follow me. They followed you. And so now y'all went in there. So that guilt is with me every day. So I yeah. strive to be what I can be. And I got it hard. But like I said, I've been part of an organization since I was a kid. Now I'm 50 years old next year in a couple months. And I'm like I'm by myself. Wow. Because the same people I used to run with and deal with, I can't do it anymore because they ain't. They stuck. Mm -hmm. They stuck. They stuck, and they don't want to do better. I come home with a trucking company, did all type of opportunities for y'all to come on, man. Let's get it. But they don't want. They don't want and it, I, man. And I spoke to one of my partners the other day, and I said, "Why is this? Everybody that don't hang around the set, they successful, but the people that be around, they ain't nothing. So I gotta leave what we grew up in just to make it. That don't make sense mm -hmm. to me. We supposed to be making it right here as a whole, but you gotta disattach yourself." from the rest of us, the people you grew up in love, willing to kill and die for, just for you to make it, something ain't right. It's because they, they still think of you back back then. Every time they look at you, they think you the same person. They, they can't see the change. Yes. Kevin, what's the worst riot that you ever been in? Riot? In prison. Do you know what I'm talking about? Uh -huh. The worst riot. And what caused it? Well, I'm a, well I ain't... Right. Well, I was in L.A. Well, I was in uh, San Bernardino. It was the Mexican IE mob against the blacks. And it started with phone. Over phone. They wanted to 
control the phone. I hate Mexicans, they wanted to control the phone. And me and my homeboy, gangster, we was there. We got gaffled up and we got caught up in down in San Bernardino. I'm finna use the phone. I don't know nothing about these politics. That's, yeah. That was the first time I ever experienced it. And this is in Fed? No, this is in the state in, the state in okay. San Bernardino, California. Okay. And I'm like, this is before I came back to Oklahoma. I came back to Oklahoma. That's when they gaffled me up and sent me to the state. Okay. But I got gaffled up in there on my way to Gardena yeah. and all that. So we was up, we were in that line, and, man, it was just that Mexican outnumbered the blacks to, I'm going to say, five to one. So the, the dude snitched on us and got us out. It's In the end of my book, they got us out the way, and they sent us to the max. Cause we was going to ride. We ain't. Bound down, but the other blacks sold us out. Them the troublemakers. No, nah, we mm. standing up. So we go to the another side of the facility, maximum security now, where it's really even on a race tip. A couple months, uh, I'll say three or four weeks later, the Mexicans rode on the dudes where we was at. Beat them up, cause the only one I know, cause we rode on the Mexicans and they they cut my eye. When we, I threw something and hit me in my eye. So they had to go give me stitches in my eye. So when I went on the bus, one of the guys was over there with me. They went to court and got his lesser time and went to a, back to where they rode it. Man, they had shoe prints and horseshoes, all of them. Because he threw a trash can at them, but he hit the CO. They beat him with billy clubs and all that. Man. He said, man, them dudes ain't not. I say, I knew it. They going to get us over here. They weren't going to ride. So that was a crazy situation. It was my first ride ever. You know yeah, what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. I ain't never been in prison. Yeah. So that right there, it took off against the Mexicans in San Bernardino, California. And that's in this book. Mm -hmm. The Garden, what's the name the of this one? Garden Block. The an Garden tale. Block. Man, Urban Tale. An Urban mm -hmm. Tale. What made you uh, write this book? Really, I seen uh, Monster Cody. He had wrote <laughs> his book back then. I'm on, I'm on H Block. And that, that's in uh, Oklahoma, the maximum security on the ground. That's where I turned 21 at. Wow. They said I was a threat to the population and everything, so they had me where I couldn't even come in contact with another human being. So I was down there, and I heard, I seen on the TV, Monster Cody book, and I read a book called Nathan McCall, Make You Want to Holler, my first time reading a book. And it was amazing. He was a journalist from out of Seattle, from Washington somewhere. And he went to prison. He came out, became a journalist, wrote a book. I'm looking like, man, I can do that. Uh -huh. Then Cody came out with his book, and my big home OG baby, OG Playboy, is in the book, cause you know, he been in jail for about 40, 50 years almost, you know what I'm saying, for killing the guy at the Rowdy Park back in Gardena. So I'm like, man, oh, he did that, and he made 100,000 off of that? So I wrote a book, you know what I'm saying? I can tell a story, you know what I'm saying? So I did it and rewrote it a thousand times, you know, and I put it out, I said, I'm gonna do it. Man, I gotta ask you a question about uh, being on the crib side. Um, about Nipsey Hussle, where, when you first heard he had got killed in front of his store, what did you think about that? Or did you even think about it? Well, I didn't think about it. I heard of, when I heard about it, I'm like, damn. Because I never knew his store and where it was located until after the fact. Yeah, I used to, we yeah. used to go there a lot. Yeah, and my homeboys in LA was with me in the feds, and that's when it happened, that's where I was at when it happened. And they were like, well, da, 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 da. you know, because Shotgun, who was in 60s, we don't get along with 60s. And so we weren't really no big thing to us, you know what I'm saying, to talk about it. But when you think about it, I'm like, what happened to his homeboy kill him? Oh, somebody, that's just, okay, Part that's how it go. They envy, jealousy, and then they come out with all the other stuff. I don't know the details because I don't get in nobody's but, but the envy and jealousy, mm -hmm, you, yeah. you picked up on it right away. No, definitely. When you're in your own neighborhood, uh, somewhere you at, there's some people to get you. That's why I say I don't got people that's all right with me. Either I love you or I hate you. All right people send you to the grave or to the prison. That's if you say, oh, he all right, he ain't all right. Either mm -hmm. I love you or I hate you. I don't got no in-betweens. That's just my model. Well, you know, the words say, and I'm a Bible-based guy, so let your yes be yes and your no's be mm -hmm. no. You know what I mean? So yeah. there, you, you're really right. Mm -hmm. you either, you either with it or you're not. You're not, because you can't halfway love me. You, you do, love me all the way or you don't. God don't even like lukewarm. <laughs> Yeah, I spew well, you out of my mouth. A double-minded man is unstable all, all his ways. ways. So all of this stuff is right mm -hmm. there. Exactly. And I yeah. live by the Bible. I read my Bible every single morning of my life. Yeah, I know me and you when we was yeah, talking, exactly. you said that you, yeah. you love to read. That, that uh, just, I, my family is crazy. I never heard my mother, grandmother, aunties, no one say a cuss word to this very day. Wow. My my grand, my grand uncles, which is my grandmother's brother, they preachers, and they go down. They skip my generation. But my my nephew is a preacher, mm -hmm. you know, and this and it it just fake. My homeboy said, "People say you faking on that reading your Bible." He said, "Man, y'all don't even know him. He was my celly. We from the street. He must say he said he read that Bible every day, man. That's him." 
I said, I don't care what people think or say. They don't okay. make me not a gangster. I'll be going on the lick. God, please let me get out to me. <laughs> I think a lot of people do that. <laughs> that's just, it's just, you know what I'm saying? That's what yeah. it is. I just, I know who created me. And God don't make junk. We make mistakes. He don't. Wow. Um, what's, what, what is, uh, like what? What is the plan for Kevin Mumford Senior? What? What? What do you? I know you start you. So you talk to the prisoners. You have a uh, podcast. Oh, yeah. So what? What's next for you, man? Man, like I said, I got this clothing brand. I'm shooting a movie to the book Garden Block right now. Okay. And uh, the letter to Princess and I, a little short movie to that. And I just want whatever God. Have me yeah. to do, man. I'm just trying to do something positive. My word, when I was learning, I'm self-educated. When I was on the ground, I read the dictionary because I can't say nothing if I don't know the meaning. So I studied, I studied, I studied. And when I came to college philanthropist, I wanted to be a philanthropist. That's been my goal since I was 21. I destroyed my neighborhood, so I want to give back to it. And I've been wanting that since I was 21 years old. So whatever it is, like I say, my first two million, I'm gonna buy everything that's tore up around that way and make it better. Make it better. You. You was locked up for 27 years. Mm -hmm. uh, you've been home for two. Almost. Almost two years. Mm -hmm. um, what do you see the biggest changes out here as far as when you came home? Because you really never really just been home. No, I've been in prison majority of my life. The biggest changes is, to me, I'm going to say the generation. I think this, because when I went to the feds, it wasn't no Facebook and all that stuff yet. And now, like getting out in 06 and seeing it was kind of the same. But getting out now with all this media and all this stuff, <laughs> it's destroying us. It's destroying our kids. Because like me and my daughter, she sitting on the phone all day. I'm thinking it's just my household. My friend like, no, no, my kid. I'm like, oh, so I need to quit tripping. Right, too. <laughs> yeah, so I need to quit tripping because, but then again, I can't. Because, man, you just laying in your bed on your phone all day and... Come on. You don't even go outside and play. You don't see. Like, we moved to Texas. I go get some neighbors. Your daughter that age, come here. I said, why you embarrass, you embarrass me? No, these are some more kids your age. They're going to go to the same school you go mm -hmm. to. I don't need you to help me meet no friends. Yeah, you do. Because you ain't going to come out your room. And your mama ain't going to make you. Believe it or not, they meet friends. They do it. And they talk back and forth through electronics. That's just the way it is. They don't know how to talk face to face anymore. No, not at all. I ran through the hills. I, we had hills in my neighborhood. We got named the Big Dipper, Big Red, because we played on them. Ran down through the Lake Canadian River, and we explored the world. You know. So. Are you gonna? Are you gonna be able to like? <clears throat> are you gonna be able to continue the podcast? Yes. See, I, uh, asked, I what I was doing is streaming. I haven't did a podcast. I just did the little streaming and on my little. Uh, phone because I like what you told me about dealing with the you know like the the, the prisoners the mm -hmm. ones who are not out mm -hmm. being able to stream yard with them mm -hmm. and then pre-recording it and maybe yeah. uploading it to YouTube that's hard if yeah. you can talk to them all the time yeah. like that because yeah. 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 I think people can be helped through that resource I'm supposed to be doing it now <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean later today or something with my partner because see they just, the guys I know like you say hockey is gang forever I got a cousin in there both of them is on murder they brothers he started a program to help the kids. He's not longer a shotgun. When you call him his name, he said, that ain't me. And when he asked me about that, I say, I condone what you're doing, man. Hold on, what? Um, well, you know, how can people get a hold to you if they're trying to link up with you just for motivation, just to, if they're going through something? Because you're a guy that could speak uh, things to them that other people can't because you've done the things that some of these, some of these mothers' kids may be facing. Yes. Uh, some of these uh, fathers' kids may be facing. Mm -hmm. They could call you and you may could give them something, some insight where you might have went in a law bit library trying to fight for your life, mm -hmm. and, and they don't even realize that. I know how powerful it is when you go into a situation and you have to be fighting for your life. So yes. at the end of the day, you know some things that a lot of other people are not going to know when it comes down to how to deal with the judicial system. And I think a lot of times our children and, and the people that look like us are very, very uneducated when it comes down to facing different situations after they came in came up in an impoverished environment. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? So how what are how what are, how can people get a hold to you to link with you if they wanted to? And I know I said a lot. <laughs> <laughs> no, I got a Facebook page, uh it's Kevin Mumford Senior and then the um uh, the YouTube channel, OG Baby Playboy, um the YouTube channel and then uh Instagram I think it's Vic Romero on Instagram and 
my cards. Wow. I'm a personal trainer as well. So yeah, yeah, yeah. We, mm-hmm. yeah, I, I remember you told me that. So I mean, just, just it's it, it, like I said, I, this won't be the last time me and you link. Uh, I appreciate you for coming on the show, man. Um, uh, we definitely uh, we we cherish these moments. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And I thank God that you're free after being locked up, incarcerated for 27 years, and and being married for how long? Yeah. Thirty. We've been together 33 years. How long have you been married? I've married since 04. Okay. So I don't know no count. <laughs> <laughs> you supposed to know these uh, things uh, now. No, Come on. I, I, hey, I don't know. I got to count. Four, five, Say, five, man. Like I said, I well, don't know. Well, thank you so much, man. We love you, brother. I, love, I and, appreciate And we definitely going to be rocking out again. I, I plan to keep on doing things to try to elevate our people understanding on what our people go through and I think you one of those keys to help mm-hmm. just like uh, Tola about to come mm-hmm. so man thank you so much yeah, for coming on the you. show man and uh, hey man if you guys uh, make sure you like and subscribe to Boss Talk 101 man uh, it's been another great segment of Boss Talk 101 where the bosses talk and we out mm-hmm.